Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning to you, depending on where you are in the country. Uh, my name is Jose Leon. I am the Chief Medical Officer for the National Center for Health and Public Housing. Thank you so much for joining uh, this webinar, Beyond the Basics, Medications for Smoking Cessation. It's such a great honor and such a great pleasure to host this activity uh, with someone who's been doing a lot on this particular topic uh, for the National Center for Health and Public Housing. Frank basically has been working for the last um, three or four years providing his expertise on this topic. And we have done a lot uh, from webinars to learning collaboratives to publications. And we are discussing um, other uh, um, training activities on this particular a topic. So if you, are on, uh, if you are not familiar with everything that Frank has done for the National Center for Health and Public Housing, I uh, invite you to go to our website, uh, www.nchph.org, go to our resource library, the best or uh, the easiest way to get um, to the uh, materials is just type in this uh, search box, uh, smoking cessation or smoking or tobacco, and then you will see all the publications and resources that um, we have hosted and Frank has um, done for the National Center for Health and Public Housing. Uh, next slide, please. So just a few housekeeping items. At this moment, uh, all participants are muted. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to engage in the chat, type your question in the chat box, or if you would like to ask your question verbally, you can use the raise hand icon and your line will be unmuted. At uh, this moment, uh, the, uh, the uh, webinar is being recorded and the slides, recordings, and a recording and other material will be sent to all participants via email in the next few days. Next slide, please. The National Center for Health and Public Housing is uh, funded by HERSA to provide training and technical assistance to all health centers. We're talking about the 13 plus or 1400 plus uh, community health centers across the nation. And we uh, specialize or we are focused on those health centers located in or immediately accessible to public housing. Next slide, please. Just a quick reminder uh, in 2021, um, 13, over 1,300 um, community health centers provided services to 30 million patients in the United States, 485 of uh, these health centers reported to be in or immediately accessible to public housing and provided services to 0.5 to 5, 5, 7.0 million patients. And 100, 108 uh, of these 485 health centers receive uh, funds from HERSA to provide services to uh, people living in public housing. And in the same year, they provided services to, pay, uh, to over 900,000 patients. Next slide, please. Quick uh, reminder on uh, public housing demographics. Um, there are over 1.5 million residents living in public housing. The average uh, 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 host household is two persons per household. 38% uh, of those uh, households uh, report to have a person, at least one person with a disability. 52% uh, of them are white, 91% uh, are low income, 43% are African American, 26% are, are Latino or Hispanic. 19% of the household report to have someone over the age of 65. 36% uh, report to have at least uh, one child who is um, younger than 18. And 32% of this household are leaded or headed by female patient with children. I'm sorry, uh, female uh, people with children. Um, next slide, please. One of the reasons why uh, we provide training on smoking cessation is because um, smoking is, is prevalent you know, or more prevalent when you compare it to the general population in public housing. 
and in those living in hot assistant housing in general. And about 33% of those living in public housing are current smokers. And that's the reason why we uh, think that this is a very important topic, um, not only for the health centers uh, located in or immediately accessible in or immediately accessible to public housing, but all health centers. Uh, HHS is also prioritizing uh, tobacco cessation. We need to remember that uh, tobacco use is linked to other chronic medical conditions such as diabetes or heart disease. And these two conditions are prevalent among not among the public, among public housing residents and other special and vulnerable populations in the United States. Next slide, please. In regards to mental health conditions and substance use disorders, um, the 2021 UDS data report that uh, FQACs in general report over 1.1 million patients um, who have a tobacco use disorders. Uh, those located in or immediately accessible to public housing report over 900,000 patients and those uh, who are Public housing primary care guarantees over 32,000 patients. Uh, it's uh, interesting to see the difference um, because uh, between federal qualified health centers and those located in or immediately accessible to, to public housing, because as, uh, as uh, I just said uh, in one of the previous slides, um, there are over or almost 1,400 community health centers in in uh, total and 485 uh, or one third of them are in or immediately accessible to public housing. And when you see the number of those diagnosed with um, substance use disorders and tobacco use disorders, uh, the difference is, <laughs> well, the, the numbers are very close despite the fact that the numbers of community health centers are you know, like one third of the community of all community health centers are located in or immediate accessible to public housing. Next slide, please. So it's my honor to introduce uh, Frank Vitalin. Frank is the national director of the Pharmacy Partnership for Tobacco Cessation and has worked in the smoking cessation field since 1987, designing cessation programs, educating over 20,000 health professionals in how to help patients stop tobacco use and counseling nearly 10,000 patients to quit. He received a BA in liberal arts from St. Vincent College in 1974 and a master's degree in psychology from Duquesne University in 1988. He entered the field as health educator, then as a clinic coordinator for the long health study, researching the differential effects of smoking cessation and inhaled medication on the prevention of COPD in identify high-risk individuals. Fran followed this by becoming project director of Long Health Study 2. Uh, subsequently, he created a six-hour CE program, the International Smoking Cessation Specialist Program, designed to teach pharmacists how to do a smoking cessation counseling, writing the patient support booklets that accompany this training, as well as all auxiliary materials. This program has been presented throughout the US, Puerto Rico, Spain, and the United Kingdom. In addition, he contributed content material for the uh, Prescription for Change curriculum. Uh, he is currently a clinical assistant professor at Purdue's uh, College of Pharmacy, working on a myriad of projects were designed to train pharmacists, physicians, respiratory therapists, and other clinicians interested in adding cessation counseling to their practice. Good afternoon, Frank. All right, thank you, Dr. Leon. Welcome, all of you. Um, from beautiful downtown Pittsburgh, where I am located. Um, right now it is sunny and in the 60s, so very unusual weather for us. Um, so today we are going to focus on the medications for cessation, um, specifically the seven FDA approved meds that are out there to help your, to help your patients quit. Three of these are over the counter, so we'll be discussing those. The other four are prescription, and I'm, I'm guessing that most of you are not prescribers. However, this will give you enough information for you to feel comfortable at least talking about these um, products with them, and then knowing um, <clears throat> who to refer to a physician 
um, to get a prescription. And then finally, I'm going to take a couple of minutes at the end. I think this is really important to understand um, that there are drug interactions between some constituents in tobacco smoke and many commonly prescribed medications. So that's a lot to cover in the 45 minutes that I have. So first of all, I am not going to go into all kinds of detail about um, dosing and usage and um, you know, how much to take when and how often and all that kind of stuff. I'm going to give you a very comprehensive chart that you will get in the next few days that covers all of that. Most of it is pretty clear cut, um, easy to read, um, you know, no different than most other uh, dosing instructions for any medications. Rather, what I'm going to do is go into more specific detail about my experience over the last 35 years with these medications, who they're good for. All seven of them individually produce a, a doubling of, of quit rates over um, placebo. So they all kind of give you the same quit rates, but the difference is that certain types of people, certain groups of people like certain medications better than others. So I'm gonna to try to give you my personal take on a lot of these um, uh, medications. Now, my basic protocol, my basic way to approach this is that there are two parts to smoking, so there are two parts to quitting. It is both a physical addiction to nicotine, but it's also a habit, a behavior. And in order to quit successfully, we know from um, the clinical practice guidelines, which is a meta-analysis of over 8,000 research studies, plus my experience and my colleagues' experience over the last 40, 45 years, is that in order to quit successfully, you need to do both of these simultaneously. However, due to the time restrictions that we have in these trainings, I'm only going to talk about the medications today. I have done some other trainings on the um, uh, behavioral aspects of this. And so you can go to the website that you will be referred to at the end of the training to uh, listen to those. But again, you really want to make sure that your patients get into a behavior change program, either through you, all these seven medications that are going to be talking about have a behavior change program that goes with them, or refer your patients to the quit line that is available in your state, in addition to recommending that they use a medication. Now, the guidelines that I am referring to, and as you can see, anybody other than these four categories can use the uh, medications. Now, be aware that you can use these medications in these four categories. It's just that there isn't enough research in any of them for the guideline to recommend them. I've used them in, in all these um, areas and they're perfectly safe and perfectly fine. But the guidelines only went with what is um, uh, backed by clinical trials and clinical studies. Given that, you can see, and I think many of you on here are probably dealing with individuals who have substance abuse or psychiatric or behavioral health problems. As you can see, that's not on here. So you can use these medications with confidence in those populations. Now, what is available? Well, right now there are seven medications. As I said, three are over the counter and four are prescription. The three over-the-counter are nicotine replacement therapy, so they are giving you nicotine in a different form than you are getting when you inhale it through your lungs via a cigarette. Then there are four prescription. The oral and the nasal inhaler are nicotine replacement, same, uh, and same category as the patch, the gum, and the lozenge. And then there are two non-nicotine medications, bupropion, which many of you probably know as the antidepressant Wellbutrin and Varenicline, which is marketed under the name Chantix. Um, and it is, it is its own category of medication. So I'm gonna go over each one of these in turn. And as I said, give you some little tidbits out all of them. Now, why are we using these products? Well, very quickly and very um, succinctly, what happens when you inhale nicotine into your lungs via cigarette 
it hits the brain in 11 seconds. It's this huge wham. And because you get so much of it and because it gets you, to you so fast, you really, really like it. It's very reinforcing. However, the moment you stop smoking that cigarette, all those levels begin to drop and drop and drop and drop and drop until you get into withdrawal, which is irritability, anxiousness, restlessness, impatience, all kind of negative emotions. So how do you get rid of that? You smoke another cigarette. So all day long, the person who smokes is going up and down, up and down, up and down. And in a sense, smoking is doubly addicting because you're smoking to get those hits and to prevent those dips. These nicotine replacement products work because they give you just enough nicotine to keep you out of withdrawal, but they also eliminate those hits because you're getting less nicotine at a slower rate. So remember two words here, lower and slower. Lower levels of nicotine, slower um, delivery, slower um, uh, you know, uptake of it. So that then eliminates the reinforcing effect and lets you then slowly taper yourself off of the nicotine. So the whole point here is to help you feel comfortable by primarily getting rid of that withdrawal so that you can then work on breaking the behavioral part of this. So these are not pills to help you quit smoking, to help you stop smoking. Rather, they are an aid to keep you comfortable enough so that you can work on the behaviors that will help you stay quit permanently. Now, varenicline and bupropion, as I said, are not nicotine, but they do something similar in the brain to produce the same effect. So that's it in 25 words or less. Again, we don't have enough time to really go into a lot of detail about. So the nicotine patch. Nicotine patch, so we're gonna start now with the actual medications. Looks like a big Band-Aid, as you can see in the picture. There's a backing, you take it off, it has an adhesive, and you just put it on your skin. It's meant for 24-hour use, and there are three steps to it. It's easy to use, you just put it on once a day. I like this because it is easy to use, and it's something that most people take to quite um, quickly. And it's nice because nobody knows that you're quitting smoking if you have this on. So you can put it um, anywhere on the upper part of your body and hide it so that it, your, your smoking is anonymous. Now, these are the um, dosing instructions. As I said, you'll have these slides. You can look at that. You'll have that chart. I'm not going to go into it because we don't have a lot of time. What I will tell you is that you want to put it on a dry, clean, hairless place. And that's very important. If you can kind of see my arm here, I have a lot of hair right here. So I would not want to put it, the patch, on that part of my body because for two reasons. First of all, it would not completely adhere to my skin, so I'm not getting the full dosing. But when I go to take it off, I'm going to rip out all that hair. It's really, really going to hurt. So that's one little tip. Secondly, you want to make sure and rotate the sites over a week period of time. The adhesive can be irritating to a person's skin, so you don't want to put it in the same place every day. Now, given that, you can put it anywhere on the upper body, you know, up here, you know, over here, um, on the top of your back, on your bicep, tricep, any place like that where it's not on a joint. Um, however, again, you want to really be careful with the hairy parts, and you know, that's some challenging for some men who have a lot of hair in their body. So you do not want to shave a spot to put the patch on because shaving irritates the skin. You put the patch on top of that, it will just create a lot of skin irritation. Do not cut the patches. Nicotine deteriorates when exposed to air. It's pretty uh, useless. Now, there are some side effects, namely what I just talked about, the skin irritation. And you can mitigate that by, again, being careful about where you're putting it but also using cortisone cream or cordate or something like that. It's usually just a little bit of a rash that you get, like prickly heat, I call it from, you know, the babies get. Um, it's not really bad. I've never really worked with anybody that had it so bad that they had to stop using it. However, the vivid dreams are an interesting phenomenon. Apparently, if you're getting nicotine all night long, and the reason you're wearing this for 24 hours is that, as you can guess, most people don't smoke while they're sleeping. So when they wake up in the morning, they are in withdrawal. 
the, you know, they have the, the, the highest, the, the strongest withdrawal first thing in the morning. So this is to prevent that. Well, what happens is it, it stimulates the um, uh, dream center in the brain and people have very active, colorful, interesting dreams. Now, many of my patients like those dreams. So this is not necessarily a problem. You need to ask the person, is it keeping you awake? Um, are they bothersome? If they say yes, then you can wear the patch just while you're awake, take it off before you go to bed, put a new one on in the morning, and that should mitigate that. That's also a, um, something you can do with individuals who do have the skin irritation. So who likes this? The people who like this are people, as I said, who don't want to have anybody know they're quitting, but this is also for people who tell you that they don't want to think about it. They just want to do something once a day and forget about it. So this is for the easy peasy, um, I don't want to have to consider anything group. The gum and the lozenge on the other hand are for people who tell you, I want to be involved in my therapy because for both the gum and the lozenge, you have to dose yourself consistently through the day in order to give you a nice steady amount of nicotine that you would get from the patch just by putting it on. So the patch is passive, this is active. So that's the big difference. Now the gum looks like a big chiclet. It comes in various flavors, two and four milligrams. It is dosed based on time to first cigarette in the morning. So as the lozenges, if you smoke immediately upon getting up, then you should use the four milligram. If you don't smoke until like 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning, then use the two milligram. This is a much more accurate indicator of how um, addicted you are than the number of cigarettes you smoke. So remember that the, the um, dosing is based on time to first cigarette in the morning. This gives you the dosing schedule. Again, I'm not going into that. Just be aware that you have to do this on a regular basis throughout the day. So for most people, you need to use about 10 to 15 pieces of this while you're awake. Now, while that may be a pain in the neck to many people, many others actually like it because it kind of mimics the behavior that pattern that they had when they smoked. So a very quick, easy way to understand whether or not a person will do this is to say, can you do something 10, 15 times a day? You know, are you willing to do that? If they say no, then don't go with the gum or the lozenge because they're both dosed the same way. Now, I like this product as, uh, as Dr. Leone said, we, uh, in the lung health study, we use this product for many, many years. It works very well if you use it correctly. And the problem here is that most people do not use this correctly because it's called gum. If you chew this like chewing gum, all the nicotine goes into your stomach. Your stomach is acid, nicotine is base. You remember back to chemistry class, when acid and base get together, it's neutralized. So this is completely and totally useless if you chew it like that. What you need to do is to follow the technique that is on this slide. You wanna bite down on it 9, 10, 12, 15 times, whatever it needs for your individual um, pH in your mouth until you get a tingly peppery taste. That's the nicotine. As soon as that emerges, you ball it up and put it between your cheek and your gum and leave it alone. It usually takes a minute or two for the nicotine to be absorbed from you know, the, that particular um, configuration. You'll know that the nicotine is absorbed when the taste disappears, when that tingly peppery taste goes away. So you bite down on it again, you know, five, six, seven more times, it um, exposed new surfaces and then move it to a different spot. One piece usually lasts about 30 minutes. This is a visual representation. So the rest of this you can um, look at on your own, but it's very, very, very important that people use this correctly or it doesn't work. If they tell you they've tried it and, it's, and they tell you, oh, it's garbage or it didn't do anything, they, they chewed it like chewing gum. So you really want to look at somebody and have them practice using a piece in front of you before you. Uh, now, this, uh, 
um, has very few precautions and very few side effects. I, the only people I would not use this with are individuals that have a lot of dental work or braces. It is very viscous and it can get stuck in between all that. And if a person has TMJ, um, it's pretty hard and you have to bite down on it many times. Otherwise, anybody can use it. Who's this good for? Well, people, as I said, who want to be involved in their therapy, people who miss the oral gratification from smoking because you're putting something in your mouth with this and you have to move it around and all that kind of stuff. Um, this does mitigate weight gain for a while because if you think about it, I'm telling you, you have to do this pretty much every hour on the hour and, and a piece is good for about 30 minutes. You can't drink or eat anything while this is in your mouth. So you're actually reducing the amount of time you have to snack <laughs> and to eat junk by half. So if somebody's really concerned about weight gain, this might be good. And finally, and I'm not being funny here, I recommend this for people who have boring jobs. So if you're sitting in front of a computer all day, if you're a truck driver, if you're a night watchman, you have all kinds of time. This fills up time because you have to keep track of how many pieces, you have to keep track of where you moved it, you have to keep track of you know, how many bites you put down on it. So this takes up a lot of time. Now, if you have somebody that wants to use an oral product but can't chew gum or won't chew it correctly, simply because it's just you know, not within their, <laughs> their uh, it correctly, then recommend the lozenge. It's for the same groups of people, but because it looks like a Tums, it um, is easier to use. In other words, you don't have to um, chew on it. You just kind of suck on it like you would any other um, um, cough drop or anything, you know, piece of candy like that. Um, it does come in um, lots of flavors also. Um, and two and four milligram. Again, the dosing and all that other stuff is exactly the same as the gum. Now, with this, you're not chewing it. You're just sucking on it, much like you would a piece of hard candy or a piece of uh, uh, pop -pop. And you just let it slowly dissolve. So you put it between your cheek and your gum and just leave it alone. Most people will do this correctly because they know how to do this um, you know, from all the candy and stuff we've eaten as kids. Usually it takes about 20, 30 minutes for one piece to dissolve. I tend to use this product more than the gum because it is easier to use and people do um, use it correctly. So those are the three over-the-counter products, you know, very quickly, succinctly. Now, up until uh, 2014, there were, you know, several um, restrictions placed on using this that went away. So I want to point those out to you. You can start to use these products before somebody actually quits completely. So they could use a piece of the gum or the lozenge to substitute for a cigarette to kind of go, you know, like you smoke one cigarette, then use a piece of gum, smoke a cigarette, use a piece of gum in order to get used to it. You can put the patch on for a day or two just to try it out to see. If none of that is going to hurt anybody. Um, you know, it's very clear that the getting a little bit of extra nicotine when you're smoking or you know actually having a cigarette when you're on these products doesn't hurt anybody. So if you have a slip, in other words, if you're on these medications and you happen to have a cigarette, you don't have to stop, just stay on it. And then it's very clear after years and years and years of working with these medications that the normal two to three months that are recommended for staying on these products for many people is not enough. You can stay on these products for years if you need to. It's better than smoking. Now, I'm not recommending that. I'm not telling you to tell somebody that at the beginning, but if they feel like they need to stay on this stuff for you know, six, eight, 10 months, there's no problem. The lung health study had people on these, on the gum for five years, and we were getting, um, uh, hospital records on these patients every six months. And so we inadvertently got a new, another study from what we were looking at. Not what I can tell you for sure, not one single untoward effect for anybody who was on the product for all those years. 
In fact, one of our former presidents, my understanding is that is still on Nicorette after like uh, been on and he's been on it for 10 or 12 years. So again, you can do it. It's just not something that I would rec necessarily recommend. All right, so we have two nicotine products that are our prescription, an oral inhaler and a nasal spray. I'm just gonna go over these very quickly and mention them because they aren't used very much, um, but they are out there, so you should know about them. The, nic the oral inhaler looks like a fake cigarette. And it, as you can see, there's a little plug there that has a, that has nicotine on a sponge. Um, when you put the two pieces of that together, it breaks the seal and then you puff on this like you would a cigarette. Um, I don't know why this has not been used very much. It's pretty effective. It gives you a nice um, uh, amount of nicotine, but for whatever reason, it has not sold well across the United States. Now, I can tell you why the nasal spray has not been very popular. It looks like um, uh, Flonase and Beccanase, Vansonase, all those um, dose allergy medications that are out there and you're squirting it up your nose um, to give you uh, the nicotine. Now, you know that in order for a medication to be put on the market, the FDA requires that you do placebo-based double-blind studies which means that neither the participant nor the uh, people running the study know who has what. So that means that the placebo has to have the same effect as the medication to mask it. So guess what the placebo was for the nasal spray? What do you think spraying nicotine up your nose feels like? <laughs> well, and this is true, the placebo was pepper spray. So spraying nicotine up your nose hurts like heck. And on top of that, um, it is very irritating. Um, many people who use this, you know, report that they have runny noses and headaches and all such. So this has proven to be extremely unpopular. I only tell you about it because it's still on the market. I'm not sure why. That's what it looks like. So again, you can look at these directions plus the other ones that I gave you um, on the chart that you will get uh, to see how to use it. Again, those are, those are prescriptions, so you'd have to re, uh, refer somebody to. Now, there are no real contraindications as for using these medications. However, there are some precautions. Primarily, they are cardiac, so these are on the label, so I just mentioned them to you to be aware of them. However, the um, uh, American College of Cardiology many years ago, many, many years ago, did a white paper on these products and basically said, and again, I'm not being funny, that unless the person's having a heart attack right in front of you, they can use um, these medications. Essentially, the cardiac problems are not caused by nicotine. They're caused by the carbon dioxide that's produced from smoking and all the other junk that's in tobacco. So, these products are deemed safe in that population. However, again, if you're not a prescriber or a physician, I would certainly have them use it under their doctor's um, uh, uh, you know, uh, purview. And again, I give you some of the uh, uh, references here um, uh, for you to look at. All right. So that leaves us with the two non-nicotine medications, bupropion and varenicline. So as I said, bupropion is Wellbutrin. It's exactly the same thing. And this was accidentally discovered to be effective by a doctor who was um, working at a VA hospital. And she was using Wellbutrin to treat all her depressed veterans and noticed that about half of them had stopped smoking um, on their own. So this gave, gave her the aha moment where she then created a study and they discovered that as Wellbutrin works to stimulate dopamine, which is what nicotine stimulates in the brain. Remember I said those neurotransmitters were um, uh, uh, stimulated when the nicotine hit the brain um, and primarily it's dopamine. Because they work the same way, it did seem to have an effect and help people quit. 
So this was marketed under the name Zyban for many, many years. Um, these are the directions for using it. It was like the miracle drug. Everybody used it. Everybody loved it. And then it just kind of went downhill. Um, people stopped using it. Primarily, I think, because there are lots of precautions and contraindications, especially it, the fact that this lowers seizure threshold. So many people were wary of it. It primarily stopped being used because Chantex came out, you know, Reticlean, which we'll get to in a second. Um, but what I, what, what I do want to tell you here is that Zyban does no, no longer exist. They took it off the market. Um, GlaxoSmithKline is the manufacturer. It, the sales dropped so much that they took it off the market. So if you want to use this, and it's still something that works, I, it works very well, um, you need to um, get a prescription for bupropion. Just generic bupropion is still around. All right. <clears throat> That leads us to varenicline. Varenicline is the latest medication that has been approved. Um, and Dr. Leo was asking me before the training, is there anything new on the market? And you know, it's now going to be close to, uh, you know, what is it, 58, 16 years? 16, that the late last medication came out. Um, the answer to that is not really. There is a medication called cytos cytosine, cytosystine, that um, has, is like varenicline. And there are some studies going on now to determine whether or not um, it is effective and whether the FDA, uh, it can be submitted to the FDA, but that's still very far off. Um, so I don't really anticipate that happening for many years. There is no new way to deliver nicotine. I mean, we've pretty much come up with every, every variation of that. So this is the last, medication to be approved. And I think probably right now, the seven that I've gone over are going to be it. Now, this medication is in a whole category by itself. It is a nicotine receptor agonist, which means it activates those receptor sites in the brain and folds them into thinking that nicotine has arrived. So it gets rid of cravings and withdrawal. However, the interesting thing about this product and what um, I like about it is that if you smoke while you are using this, the nicotine molecule cannot get to those receptor sites because this blocks it. So there's no pleasure. There's no point in um, using the, or in smoking. That there's no reinforcing effect. So this is really, I think, not only is this good for people who, uh, you know, for their first quit attempt. But I think this is also good if you have somebody that comes to you and says, I've tried to quit a million times and I keep relapsing. This may be ideal for them. So there are um, you know, many uh, uses, instructions with this, dosing, all that kind of stuff. Again, you can look at this yourself. Again, the bupropion and the varenicline are both prescription medications, you do need to get a doctor to um, apply them. Now, I wanna spend a few moments here talking about this Eagle study. So many of you may be aware that probably a few years after varenicline came out, there were all these reports of neuropsychiatric side effects, especially like delusional thoughts and suicidal thoughts and um, just, um, weird feelings, et cetera, that people were claiming were due to the medication. So the FDA slapped a black box warning on the product. And essentially it said to be very, very careful about using this in any kind of psychiatric, um, with any kind of psychiatric or behavioral health individual, and just to be very careful in general because of all of these reports. They also put this on bupropion, because it, they, they um, know that similar issues arose from using some antidepressants. However, in there, and I and really appreciated the fact that they did this, they weren't sure if the medication was doing this or causing this effect. So they mandated this study occur. And any of you who are familiar with research know that this was a very, very large study, unusually large. 
8,000 participants. Half of them had psychiatric diagnoses prior to coming into the study, half did not. They did it in 140 different places. So this was huge, hugely spread over the globe. And they looked at four arms, gave people just varenicline, gave people just bupropion, gave people the nicotine patch and nothing else, and then placebo. And what they were looking at is what were the neuropsychiatric side effects that were reported in each one of these and what was the difference among all of them. They also did, as I told you before, um, they did counseling sessions with this. So there was a behavioral component and they did it um, for a fairly long time. So this is the results. And I found this fascinating. So what you're looking at here is that essentially there was no difference between the people who were not getting anything. So they were, the placebo was people who were not getting any kind of medication and those getting varenicline, bupropion, the patch. And it was the same with the psychiatric and non-psychiatric. So yes, there was a little bit more with the psychiatric patients, but there was no very, very little difference among the four arms. So what this was telling us is that it was not varenicline that was causing these neuropsychiatric events. So what was it? Well, it was what we thought in the field. Many of us already thought this to begin with. Those neuropsychiatric events were actually withdrawal symptoms from nicotine. <coughs> Excuse me. So what this study clearly told us was that this product could be used safely in any population. And interestingly enough, we also looked at the efficacy in each one of those medications and we found here that the highest efficacy was with varenicline. So this gave us one of the first head-to-head -head studies amongst the medications. So varenicline produces the best good results and is safe and effective in all populations. So for only the fourth time, I think, in FDA history, they removed the black box warning from both varenicline and bupropion. So you can use these safely with any, any population. Again, though, I would certainly keep track of people and follow up with them the first few weeks after they quit, but I would, would tell you to do that anyways. And if you notice any kind of odd behavior or odd feelings, then you know, really look into what is happening with that individual. Now, the other um, highly efficacious um, quit uh, medication is combination therapy. So this is where we're taking a long-term medication, long-acting formulation, the patch, and then adding on a gum, lozenge, inhaler, nasal spray, PRN, to deal with situational urges. So we're pretty much doing this as standard of care right now. The patch gets rid of what I would call the background withdrawal, and then you will use the um, gum, lozenge, inhaler, nasal spray, PRN to deal with situational urges. And then what happens is that after a week or two or three, the individual will stop using the short term and then just stay on the patch and then get off of that you know, the, um, according to um, the recommendations. <clears throat> Bupropion and NRT together um, is, has, was shown to be helpful. That was part of the initial bupropion studies, but um, since then, it's not really shown that it have that much effect. And then we really have not done any um, studies of combining varenicline with bupropion <clears throat> and NRT. There's very little evidence out there. So I would not go with those. But as I said, my colleagues now um, who are currently running cessation programs, pretty much this is all they do. Mayo Clinic, which is the leader in this field, Anybody that goes there, they put the patch on you and then you get gum or lozenge on, or one of the others um, on top of that. So very safe, very effective. And guys, it's almost impossible for these individuals that you're working with to get too much nicotine from these products. They already have a tolerance for it in their body. So combining the products um, is not going to give them 
um, any more than what they already have in their bodies. So again, do this, it's safe, it's, and it's very effective. These are what the clinical practice guidelines recommend um, based on the, um, based on the um, uh, evidence that is out there. Now, there are many other products that have nicotine in them. Um, none of them has shown to be, have any efficacy, so do not um, recommend these. Don't let anybody use them. They're, they're just a waste of money, um, including vaping, okay? My answer is pretty emphatic here. I would not suggest that you use vaping to help anybody or uh, suggest it to anybody to quit. Two reasons here. First of all, the evidence is still kind of out about whether or not this actually helps anybody quit because most people who are using um, any kind of vaping product are not in any kind of behavior change program. They're not in any kind of formal program. So what ends up happening is they're using both. They end up using the vaping product when they can't smoke and smoking when they can. So it's really not yet proven to be that effective. Is it safe? Well, it is safer than smoking. I will give you that. But there are still tons of other chemicals in here in the, um, uh, the vape pens and you know, uh, devices that are harmful. I did a whole training on this a while, um, a few a month or so ago. So that has been recorded. You can listen to that and it'll give you some details um, on. Um, All right, so that is it for the medications. Um, I know I went through them very fast, but hopefully it's given you a basis um, to be able to uh, start to have uh, uh, informed discussions with your patients. If you have questions, call your pharmacy. Um, as Dr. Leon mentioned, I worked with the RX for Change program. It's now in almost every pharmacy school in the country. So almost every single pharmacist who's graduated in the last 20 years has had some kind of smoking cessation training. Um, so you can, um, with confidence, refer people to their pharmacist to talk about um, any of these products. And depending on where you're at, right now there are 18 states where pharmacists can prescribe the four prescription medications in addition to um, selling the three over-the-counter products. So we are actively educating those and training those pharmacists. So, um, you know, look at where your, uh, what state you're located in and see what is available for you in that state. I mentioned the quit line a while ago um, as a place to refer people for behavioral help. Well, in many states, many quit lines give um, individuals who are enrolled free patches or gum or lozenge for a few weeks in order to get them going um, in their quit. So you might want to look into that for some of your patients, especially as we just referenced at the beginning here, many of the people that you're dealing with are lower income um, and they could benefit from getting some uh, free medication to start. Okay, so that leaves me with this final consideration here. It looks like we have about 10 minutes, so we should be fine. So I want you to be aware of, you know, one of the other questions I always get is, you know, why um, use these medications uh, to help quit? You know, it, besides all the other reasons, the health reasons and the money and everything else, we know that there is an interaction between the hydrocarbons in cigarette smoke and many, many medications. Now, what happens here, and, and let, let me just, emphasize that. It's the hydrocarbons in the smoke, not nicotine. <clears throat> so this has absolutely nothing to do with nicotine whatsoever. The hydrocarbons in the smoke activate the CYP1 and 2 pathway in the liver, okay? And what that does is increase the metabolism and the uh, many, many medications. So what that means is if you smoke, you end up needing more medication in order to get the effect the, of the medication. And if you, anyone on this call works with a psychiatric population, you know that by and large, and I've worked in a psychiatric hospital and day, um, a day center, uh, individual patients, 
99% of people hate taking medication in that category. So this is another motivation to quit because if you quit smoking, you need less medication. Now, why is this also important? Well, what we discovered is that if somebody on these meds quits, many times they start to have all kinds of weird side effects. And they think it's withdrawal from nicotine, but what in fact it is, is too much of their medication. So you really do need in most cases to reduce the amount of the meds that this individual is taking when they quit. Um, and interesting enough, because they thought it was side effects, they went back to smoking. So I have given you a second handout that you will get um, with uh, the, the one that gives you all the meds, having a, a handout that gives you all the known interactions between um, certain drugs and um, smoking. Um, it's up to date. We keep it up to date on the RX for Change website. So I've given you the latest version of that. As you can see, many of these are psychiatric medications, but I want to call your attention to the second one on the left-hand side, because this is something that almost all of us use, is caffeine. Interestingly enough, um, many people who smoke also use a lot of caffeine. And what we discovered early on when the, the gum and the patch first came out is that when people quit, they were telling us that they were shaky and jittery and had headaches and all this other kind of stuff. And we thought that it was, again, withdrawal from nicotine, and some of it was. But for the most part, these people were now getting double the amount of caffeine in their system from what they were drinking. So in other words, if they were drinking four cups of coffee a day when they quit smoking, they were getting the equivalent caffeine of eight cups. So if you have people telling you that they have, they're jittery and uh, nervous and uh, they're headachey and all that kind of stuff, it may be too much caffeine. So I'm not going to tell you to tell people to stop drinking coffee or sodas because that's nuts. You know, there, there's no reason to do that. All you want to do is tell them to cut it in half or start mixing decaf and regular coffee um, you know, when they're um, you know, um, taking their uh, normal cup of coffee uh, uh, during the day. But I think you'll see that if you pay attention to this, you're going to have a much more, a much smoother um, process for many, many of your So again, smoking reverses this effect. They need less medication, they need less caffeine. Um, and this can be another motivator for your individuals who are. I recommend that you go over the meds anybody's on with them before they quit. Talk to their doctor to see if there's any there. You're going to have that list. You'll be able to refer to that. Um, and then get their doctor to monitor their dosing as the, as the quit goes on um, and adjust it as, um, as needed. So again, the best way to quit smoking is to combine a medication with a behavior change program. All seven of these medications come with a behavior change program. The FDA mandated that. They're all free. Um, all you do is look on the box and it'll tell you with the website or the phone number to access it. And every state, every one of you has access to the quit line in your state. The quit number is the same everywhere. 1-800-QUIT-NOW, Q-U-I-T-N-O-W. Um, and, uh, you know, I would recommend that any patient you're working with who wants to quit, that you refer them to the quit line in addition to um, discussing a medication with them. All right. And then this is my contact information. If you have any questions or um, concerns, uh, you can contact me about that. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any, any questions um, that you might have. Thank you, Frank. Uh, great information and a lot uh, to learn on how to uh, treat patients who are current smokers. Um, we have some, some uh, information uh, as, uh, in regards to upcoming webinars and what uh, Frank is going to do um, in the next, um, in the next uh, few days. Uh, it seems that the date for that one is is not right, but um, 
Frank is going to be doing uh, uh, two webinars. Uh, the first one is the concurrent treatment of smoking cessation and substance use disorders in primary care. This is going. To, this uh, webinar will be hosted by the National Center for Healthy Public Housing and the National Nurse Death Care Consortium. That's going to be you know, uh, Wednesday, November 9th. You can uh, register on NCHPA website. If you get the uh, HRSA digest, uh, you can find a link as well. And there is another activity with, with Frank, which is busting the myth of smoking cessation for individuals with a psychiatric disorders. This is going to be on Friday, November 11th from 1 to 2 p.m. Uh, again, uh, you can uh, go to our website, nchph.org, or if you receive uh, the uh, BIPIC digest, uh, you can also register through the BIPIC digest. Um, in regards to, to uh, this activity, please make sure that you answer the uh, poll after the webinar. Your um, feedback is very important to us and it helps uh, NCHPH to improve uh, webinars and activities and, every, uh, and all training uh, activities that we're doing for uh, health centers and organizations in general. Um, if you have any question for Frank, Again, you can use the chat box or you can use the, uh, the raise hand icon at the bottom of your screen and your line will be unmuted. So uh, in the meantime, uh, please visit our website where you will find information on uh, different uh, topics and uh, publications and resources for community health centers. And um, Frank, I have a question um, while we wait for a for, for question. Uh, you, you, you are mentioning or you were mentioning the quit lines and the 1-800 quit line. Yes. And, uh, it's my understanding that health centers refer, some of their health centers refer patients to the quit line. Specifically, uh, when they are working with a patient, uh, they ask the patient whether or not they are current smokers and if they want to quit. For those who, uh, for those health centers who don't have um, medications or resources, they refer them to the quit line. So, what can a, what can patients find, you know, at the uh, at, um, at the quit line? I mean, what resources? You said uh, there are some. Um, behavioral health specialist, I guess, you know? Yes. But at the same time, uh, do, are you aware of the type of medications that they get through the, the, the hotline? Yes, most of them only give the patch and the gum or the lozenge. So it's just the over-the-counter medications, not the prescription ones. Um, when you call, you are connected to a, they're all master's level clinicians, you know, nurses, uh, psychologists, et cetera. And this is their specialty. All they do is um, help people quit smoking. So they have very good training in this. They're, they've been trained to help individuals with behavioral health problems, pregnant women, um, all kinds of different um, groups of people. Um, you generally get four to five uh, phone calls. You know, they're usually about a half hour, 45 minutes. So they create a plan that is specific to you. They help you deal with your specific triggers. And then, as I said, in some cases, you get the medication for free. Usually it's just for the first couple of weeks just to get you started so that you can save the money that you would have spent on cigarettes and then buy the next box of the product um, that you're using. It's usually not continuous. Um, and then you can call them if you have a question um, in between your regular sessions. Um, they will as far as I know, you know, keep you um, in treatment as long as you need it. They send out handouts uh, to individuals in some states. Some states will refer you to um, in-person programs. Um, there are practically every language spoken on the planet. There is somebody at one of the quit lines who speaks that language, so you can get this in your, um, you know, your native language. What I like about it is you can do it anywhere. You can be sitting under a tree in a, in a park and still be able to talk to the quitline counselor as long as you have a phone. I mean, that's the only uh, caveat here is that you have to obviously have a phone. 
um, because it's all done by phone. Um, so these have been shown, there's been a lot of research to show that these are effective, that's very helpful, that it does improve quit rates um, significantly. So I can't recommend them enough um, as an effective uh, way to help somebody quit, especially if you don't have the ability or the time in your practice to be able to do it yourself. Thank you, Frank. And it's uh, 2 p.m. Eastern time. I don't see any nope. additional no questions. So thank you so much again for joining us, please. Uh, if you have any additional questions, you can also submit your questions to, the, to our staff. And uh, if you have a, a, a question or you forgot to, or, uh, to ask a question to Frank, I just uh, send it to either Fide Pineda or send it my way. And we, we are going to make sure that Frank gets your questions. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, have a great afternoon and see you in a few weeks. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.